Georgia has many state symbols. We chose 10 that are found in the natural world and conducted an online popularity poll. Today, we'll show you the results. A Georgia state symbol countdown, next on Georgia Outdoors. Funding for Georgia Outdoors has been made possible by a grant from Mary Hall Singleton and by the Imlay Foundation. What makes you think of Georgia? Is it grits in the morning or a basket full of fresh peaches? Is it a sun setting over mountains or the glimpse of dawn on a beach? Many images embody the spirit of Georgia. Dozens have even been designated official symbols of the state. We selected 10 from the natural world and our online viewers ranked them. These are the results of our Georgia Outdoors State Symbols Countdown, starting at number 10. At the top of the countdown, our state insect is definitely the busiest of them all, the honeybee. But what makes this little guy so important? The biggest reason is pollination. The honeybee does the lion's share of pollination of the food crops in this country, and we will really be at a loss without them. The common honeybee is an exotic species from Europe, but unlike many exotics, the honeybee has made a largely positive impact in Georgia. Honeybees are the chief pollinator of about one-third of the average American diet. Honeybees are managed by humans both commercially and as a hobby. Beekeeping has been a popular tradition for centuries. In fact, there are beekeeping schools. The annual Young Harris University of Georgia Beekeeping Institute teaches hundreds of bee enthusiasts how to tend the hives. We can accommodate any beekeeper at any skill level from new out of the box beginning hobbyist to the largest commercials. First thing you need to show me is a worker bee. The beginners are going to actually get to help install a package of bees, which is three pounds of bees plus a queen into an empty hive. So it's a first experience for a lot of people to actually stick their head in the beehive, if you will. At the Institute, contestants enter products from the hive into a competition. First up is mead, a fermented wine made from honey. Virginia Webb is an award-winning honey maker, as well as a judge in the event. Mm. That is wonderful. Mead is a wonderful drink. It's the oldest alcoholic drink known to man. I look at some very specific things when it comes to mead. I want to look at not only the taste of the mead, but also the body of the mead, and certainly the aroma or the bouquet. Finally, the honey itself is tested. All honeys taste differently, and I don't try to judge honey on their specific taste, but on the cleanliness of the container, the fill of the jar, the, the quality of the honey itself, the clarity, and the moisture contents are the most popular things. Beyond the sweetness of the honey, honeybees have helped Georgia immensely over the years and deserve to be recognized as a symbol of our state. So here we have an exotic pollinator pollinating exotic food plants with minimal or no disruption to our environment. I think the benefits justify the honeybee as Georgia's state insect. Number nine is our state marine mammal. Measuring up to 55 feet in length and weighing up to 70 tons, this creature is the largest of Georgia's living state symbols. Adopted in 1985, the North Atlantic right whale is Georgia's state marine mammal. It's an ideal state symbol because it's one of the rarest uh, whales on the entire planet. There's uh, probably only about 400 left. Right whales spend their summers in the waters of New England and the Canadian maritime provinces eating plankton. In the winter, females and many juveniles journey to the Atlantic waters off South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida. Right whale migration is a recently discovered phenomenon. 
It wasn't until 1979 that scientists discovered the reason was so that females could give birth in Georgia waters. Some speculate that it's because our waters are nice and calm in the winter months. Some uh, hypothesize that we have very few large shark and other predators like killer whales and that perhaps the calves are safer. In large part, we just don't know. It's a mystery. Though there aren't many predators in the Southeast Atlantic Bight, there are other threats to the right whale. Historically, commercial whaling had a major impact on the right whale population. Many thousands of whales once swam the waters of the North Atlantic. But by the time whaling was banned in 1935, scientists estimate their numbers had dwindled to barely 100 individuals. The right whale got its name, we believe, because it was highly sought after by commercial whalers. So it was known as the right whale to hunt. They were very high in fat and oil content, so they almost always floated after they were killed. And as a result, they produced large amounts of oil for the commercial whaling industry. Today, accidental ship strikes from large ocean-going vessels and entanglement in commercial fishing nets are threats to the right whale's survival. The good news is that in the past five years, we've had many good calving years in a row, 20 to 30 calves being produced each year. And we're hopeful that with these new calves being added to the population, that some of them will grow up to be adult right whales and that they'll reproduce and that we'll see real gains in the population in the future. The Georgia Department of Natural Resources works with other agencies like the state of Florida and the New England Aquarium to perform daily aerial surveys of right whale critical habitat. We do this in order to pass right whale sighting information on to commercial shippers and to the military so that they can hopefully avoid interactions with right whales and ships. Keeping track of the North Atlantic right whale is a large responsibility. Working around these animals, which are about the size of a semi-truck, swimming around in the open ocean is quite an exhilarating experience. It's uh, really good to know that the work you're doing is helping to protect a critically endangered species. Number eight on our countdown is our state fossil. The state fossil can be found throughout the sandy soils of South Georgia, and it belongs to the ocean's top predator, the shark. Ocean levels were much higher millions of years ago. Fossilized shark teeth can be found as far north as Augusta and Columbus in what's called the coastal plain region. Anywhere the sea occupied during the past 85 million years along the coastal plain, we are likely to find shark teeth. Shark skeletons are made of cartilage instead of bone, so the only fossilized remains are usually teeth. They lose teeth regularly in a conveyor belt-like fashion. A single shark can have four or five hundred teeth in its mouth. And it's not like when you find a shark tooth that was a dead shark because they're constantly shedding their teeth. As they feed, the teeth break off. So a single shark in its lifetime will shed thousands of teeth. The largest of Georgia's prehistoric shark teeth belonged to the 40-foot-long megalodon. 65 million years ago, during the late Cretaceous period, this extinct shark roamed Georgia's waters, and what remains is rather impressive. Number seven is our state butterfly. One of the more commonly seen state symbols, especially when fluttering around flower gardens in the summer heat, is our state butterfly, the eastern tiger swallowtail. Named for the tiger-like black stripes that decorate its large yellow wings, the eastern tiger swallowtail displays remarkable beauty and grace. I think it makes a great state butterfly because it's a butterfly that's found throughout the state and whether you live in downtown Atlanta or you live in rural Georgia, you have a chance of seeing a tiger swallowtail. To make viewing easier, some people build gardens specifically designed to attract butterflies. Recently retired from the ministry in Moultrie, Georgia, Saunders Pinkard built a butterfly garden in his backyard so he could capture the fluttering beauties with his camera. I take the pictures so that I can enjoy them after I see them. Because sometimes a butterfly will only be there just a short while and you don't get a real good chance to see him. Among the many butterflies Saunders has photographed in his garden are the American snout. 
the gulf fritillary, the sleepy orange, the whirlabout, the zebra swallowtail, and of course our state butterfly, the eastern tiger swallowtail. And you just have to be patient and uh, hope that they finally will do what you want them to because it don't do any good to talk to them. They don't speak English and I don't know butterfly. Saunders built the garden to improve his photography, but now his hopes for the butterflies have grown. I decided that with the interest that I had in taking pictures, a lot of us try to encourage people to grow plants that will attract butterflies because there are a lot of butterflies that are very, very scarce. I guess it's because some of their habitat has been destroyed and they're not able to overcome it. Building the garden and taking photos has given Saunders a different perspective of Georgia's state insect. Everyone is so different and even butterflies of the same species have different patterns. I just like butterflies because it's so pretty. At number six is our state amphibian. Georgia's state amphibian can be found most anywhere but you'll probably hear it before you see it. The green tree frog's bright green skin is loud, but its call is even louder. They're a really good choice, I think, for a state amphibian because state symbols should be something that are, are things that um, most of the people within that state are familiar with or at least have a chance of observing. The green tree frog is the newest state symbol on our list. Thanks to the efforts of a group of fourth graders and their teachers from Armucci Elementary, the state amphibian was named in 2005. In third grade they had studied state symbols, so they knew that there was not a state amphibian as they were going through the list. And as we were studying amphibians, they noticed that and were very curious about it. The class received help from their state representatives and even went to the Capitol to lobby for the bill. Lobbying was very difficult, but it was fun. We went to the Capitol and we talked to a lot of people. We met a lot of, you know, really big people in the state. And we just told them what we were there for, what we, you know, why we think the green tree frog is a great symbol for Georgia. All frogs are, like, um, sensitive to pollution, and so if there's a lot of frogs, then you know that it's not bad pollution. After three years of deliberation, the Georgia legislature finally passed the bill and these now seventh graders can be proud to be part of Georgia history. I feel good that I'm part of history now that I made something big to our state. Crawling into the number five position is our state reptile. Known as an extremely long-lived creature, the gopher tortoise often lives 60 years in the wild and up to 100 years in captivity. Gopher tortoises live mainly in longleaf pine forests. This ecosystem is critically dependent on regular fires from which the gopher tortoise escapes by digging extensive burrows. These burrows can reach 40 feet in length. They're reptiles, so thermoregulation is really important, and they use their burrows to escape um, extremely hot and extremely cold weather. And also, in this ecosystem, frequent fires are a major component and the tortoises have a refuge in the burrow from fires. Although these fires once occurred regularly in nature, wildfires today are difficult to manage and can grow to be very destructive. The safest fires are controlled fires executed by trained professionals. Prescribed fire today is so important and land managers use it to mitigate wildfire risk and by applying frequent fires throughout our forests, we manage and maintain fuel loads at a safe level, therefore reducing the threat and the danger of wildfire. Gopher tortoise burrows also provide refuge for up to 300 other creatures, making the state reptile a keystone species of the longleaf pine ecosystem. During prescribed fire, it's generally moving relatively slowly. The animals know it's coming, and you'll see them moving into tortoise burrows for refuge. The Burrow is a really important structure within the landscape. Longleaf pines were once plentiful, covering up to 90 million acres before European settlement. But due to extensive logging, only 3% of that population remains. 
That extreme habitat loss has led to a major decline in gopher tortoise numbers as well, making it a federally threatened species. Near Moultrie, at Reed Bingham State Park, efforts led by park manager Chet Powell to protect gopher tortoises are underway. One of the things we want to do is determine fairly accurately how many gopher tortoises we do have here. That's where our volunteer program helps out a lot. We kept walking up on gopher burrows where the eggs had been laid and they had been dug up and all we were finding was shells. We decided that uh, the predation was so bad here that, that we needed to try and at least do a little something to, to help the population along. After the tortoises lay their eggs in the burrows, Powell and the volunteers collect each one of them to incubate and hatch under lock and key. From the time that they emerge from the egg, they are basically just on their own, so they're ready to go. We feed them a combination of zucchini, squash, and turnip greens usually. We do that every day, and they're released very quickly. We, we normally don't keep or hold them too long. We'll release them exactly at the point where they would have hatched in the wild. At number four is our state game fish. This state symbol is known as a real fighter. Georgia's state game fish, the largemouth bass, is an aggressive fish and can be caught just about any time and anywhere in the state. They put up an excellent fight. They usually jump in the air um, and, and uh, shake their heads and uh, put on a real show for an angler. Called largemouth because its jaw extends past its own eye sockets, this particular bass is a favorite among anglers. Georgia even holds the world record for the largest caught. In 1932, a 22-pound, four-ounce monster was pulled out of Lake Montgomery. I think largemouth bass is a good symbol for Georgia because, one, it's such a popular sport fish in Georgia. And on top of that, we hold the world record and held it for a long time, so I think Georgia can be proud of that fact. Georgia anglers can also use their fishing skills to help the less fortunate. Fishermen for the Hungry is a nonprofit organization that raises charity funds through tournaments. The purpose behind the Fishermen for the Hungry is, is, is to raise money for the food banks. Registration for the tournament begins first thing in the morning. Each two-man team fishes throughout the day and returns in the evening with a five-fish limit. No! 920! Awards are given to the team with the heaviest group of fish and to the team with the largest individual fish. People come from all over the southeast to participate in this charity event. We started the Fishermen for the Hungry with all intentions of doing one tournament per year uh, to help the Albany Food Bank, which is the poorest food bank, serves the poorest communities in the state of Georgia. The food bank matches $23 worth of groceries for every dollar earned from the tournament. And because of its success, Fishermen for the Hungry now hosts 10 tournaments a year, making a big difference throughout the state. We take advantage and we turn a negative situation into a positive situation, raising money for the food banks and feeding the people that need to be fed. Voted third on our state symbols countdown is another game animal. With a strong cultural history in Georgia, the bobwhite quail became our state game bird in 1970. Quail hunting has been a rich tradition here in Georgia and across the whole southeast. They are ground nesting birds and they typically nest near areas with canopy weed cover that's over bare ground. This weedy habitat was once common on unused portions of farms and plantations. However, farming practices have since changed as development has increased. Subsequently, much of this second year dead vegetation has disappeared, leading to a decline in bobwhite quail. Uh, quite a few covers on the farm now, a lot more than I used to have. And, uh... In 1998, the Georgia General Assembly worked with the Department of Natural Resources to create the bobwhite quail initiative. It's a competitive program to establish and maintain quality habitat for bobwhites and these other species. 
in Georgia, this would entail impacting uh, close to 4 million acres of habitat to restore about 200,000 coveys. One of the spinoffs from the Bob White Quail Initiative has been youth hunts held on the property of landowners who participate in the program. But they get out on the farm and get to experience dog work and see wild quail. There you go. All right, get him, get him. Good shot. All right. Woo. And it's an experience that I hope we don't lose for the future generations of Georgia. Good shot, Georgia. Woo. Yeah, get him over here. Number two is our state wildflower. The next symbol on the countdown includes more than a dozen different species and puts on a beautiful show every year. Georgia's state wildflower is the native azalea. Native azaleas are distinct from the other exotic species and hybrids that most people think of when they talk about azaleas because the natives get much taller and they're deciduous. The word deciduous describes plants that lose their leaves annually. Most azaleas found in suburban gardens are exotics from Asia and do not typically lose their leaves in winter. This is a good way to identify the true native azaleas, which are deciduous, not evergreen. Depending on the botanist you're talking to, there are about 15 species on the eastern side of the United States, 13 of which are found in Georgia counties. The beauty of native azaleas in Georgia ranges from the fiery orange flame azalea to the golden petals of the Florida azalea and includes a colorful spectrum in between. Over the years, the number of azalea varieties has grown due to hybridization. By taking pollen from one plant and putting it into the flower of another, a hybrid is created. Much of the early hybridizing was done in the 1950s by Fred Galley, the director of horticulture at Callaway Gardens. He hybridized thousands of plants, but only selected a half a dozen to really carry on the work and actually apply names to. Galley was brought in to help the founders of Callaway Gardens provide a sanctuary for native flowers, like the azaleas. Habitat loss has affected populations across the state, but planting native azaleas into your own garden adds beauty and makes a difference. Conserving our native species is a responsibility and passion shared by groups and individuals alike. Taking top honor on the list is our state tree. At number one, this state symbol not only received the most votes, but is also the longest lived at up to 1,500 years in age. The Southern Live Oak is Georgia's state tree and earned the name Live Oak because it holds its leaves year round as an evergreen. Found throughout the coastal regions of the U.S., from Virginia to Texas, the live oak is the prototypical tree of maritime forests and provides habitat for animals and other plants. Spanish moss can be found hanging lightly from the live oak's thick branches. A member of the bromeliad family, Spanish moss is actually related to pineapples and gets most of its nutrients from rain. Resurrection fern is another common tenant of live oaks. Appearing dead and brown during dry seasons, the resurrection fern, after a rain, undergoes a beautiful green awakening. The durability and shape of live oaks has also earned them great historical significance. The live oak has a very distinctive shape. It's very broad, it's spreading, the branches come down very close to the ground. The significance of this shape is that the live oaks were used in building the keels and other parts of the halls of wooden ships from colonial times on through much of the 1800s. Blackbeard Island National Wildlife Refuge was set aside as a reserve for the U.S. Navy. The live oak trees were a source of wood for building the keels of the hulls of ships in the Navy. A town in South Georgia has protected one particular live oak as a very special historic symbol. In downtown Thomasville sits the Big Oak. With a 166-foot canopy, it is actually wider than Niagara Falls is tall. We're very proud of the Big Oak. Uh, we estimated it at about 315 years. The land the oak is on used to have a house next to it, and when the lady died, she, in her will, uh, gave the land to the tree. 
Now that caused several lawyers to have to scratch their heads. And the city basically has taken it over as a park and we maintain a regular budget to ensure that the uh, oak is taken care of. In addition to having its own lightning protection system, the Big Oak has a series of cables and braces to further the longevity of this tree's existence. It's a symbol of continuancy. It, it, it keeps going. It's forever here. Like all of these symbols, the Big Oak is a representation of the state itself. No matter how big or small, no matter how plentiful, or scarce. Each one symbolizes the spirit of Georgia. Funding for Georgia Outdoors has been made possible by a grant from Mary Hall Singleton and by the Imlay Foundation.